Glenn. Welcome to Landscape Photography World. How are you going? Yeah, I'm going well, mate. And yourself? Yeah, I'm having a pretty good time. I've been revamping my website, which I hope gets released soon, but oh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> it's always something that needs something else done to it, isn't it? Uh, absolutely, yeah. The tasks, I've got a very long list of things that I want to do and very little time to do it because I keep doing podcasts with people. But you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm, yeah, I'm a little bit lazy with my website. I really need to get on there and, and do a bit of extra work and get some more images on always. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah, that's always my problem is trying to keep it up to date with the latest stuff because I keep going out, taking new and better shots. I think they're better anyway. Yeah, I'm sure <laughs> they are, mate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, why don't we start with where, what's the Glenn Walker story? Where did you get started? How did, how did photography come into your life? I guess for me... It was probably back in about 2015, 2014. I started to experiment and was quite amazed at what iPhones could do. When yep. I was on the coast, I'd do a lot of surfing and I'd be down there with my phone after I've had a surf and take shots of waves breaking on the shore. And I was just excited about what I could do with an iPhone and I showed my wife a few shots. She goes, oh, yeah, they're not too bad. We had a, a trip to Hawaii planned, a family trip to Hawaii. So she said, why don't you go out and buy yourself a a decent digital camera. And He's a nice yeah. wife. <laughs> I know. I was quite impressed with that. Yeah. And, uh, and I, so yeah, I headed out and actually I didn't head out straight away. I did a lot of research, uh, a lot of Googling, a lot of looking at different camera brands, Googling the 10 tips of landscape photography as you do. Yep. Yep. And I ended up purchasing a Canon 70D. You're allowed to mention brand names here, are we? I don't care. I've got very few <laughs> affiliations. So. Well, that's good. That's good. And I actually bumped into a, a bloke at a, one of my daughter's piano concerts and his daughter was at the concert, of course, and we got chatting afterwards. And he actually had digital cameras connected to a blimp, like a blow-up blimp. Wow. This is before, before drones became wow. huge. Bright, and, drone, drone prototypes. Yeah. yeah, that's right. It was actually had a huge trailer where he towed it around and he had a smaller version as well. And he went out and did real estate photography and, yeah, and that cool. sort of thing. Which was kind of cool, but the one thing he said to me was, he said, your camera body is a disposable item. He said, spend your money on your lenses. I took his advice and after researching, I ended up getting the Canon 70D and then I went out and bought a good quality Canon L-series landscape lens, uh -huh. 16-35, and away I went to Hawaii. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, so what, what did you shoot in Hawaii? Ah... Uh, just beautiful seascapes, palm trees, some family shots. I didn't know what I was doing with the camera. Had it on auto. Didn't know about all the other settings. But it yep. was amazing images. And yeah. so that sort of whet my appetite for photography. Yeah, so enjoyed okay. that and took five or 600 shots in a couple of weeks and came home and thought, wow, what do I do with all these photos? Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> and what did you do? Did you were you shooting JPEG or RAW or Yeah, just just shooting JPEG. I, I didn't know about RAW back yeah. then. And I didn't I was just so excited about using this camera and getting these great shots. I didn't look into all that side of it. Sure. But then another thing that my wife did, which is cool, she bought me a, a one day course on how to drive a DSLR. And it was held at the Melbourne Zoo and it was from ten till five. Yep. So that was a that just opened my eyes about what all the settings it was very basic but it went through the basics of the aperture priority time value all the different settings on your camera yeah. they just touched on a little bit of long exposure photography portrait photography nice. and that really opened my eyes to what a camera can do and that's when the fun really started i think yeah. so was that when you started looking at taking things off auto and moving around the the mode dial and definitely you know, yeah. In, in, into raw shooting and so forth? Or yeah. I didn't get into raw. Yeah, was, a little bit later on I did, but I jumped on aperture priority and just tried to remember the things that I'd learnt on the course oh, and, yeah. and put them into practice. And, yeah, that's when I started getting some really cool shots uh, with that setting. Got drawn to – obviously, I'm drawn towards seascapes, a lot of my photography. Coming out of a surfing background, I spent all my youth on the coast – all the different parts of Victoria mostly. Yeah. And, yeah, the seascape photography just really drew me in. Yeah. yeah. So what is it about the seascapes that gets you, gets you blood pumping? 
back in the day, it was getting down early, paddling out before the sun came up, going for a surf, that sort of thing. And just the wave action, the tides, the winds, the clouds, just all those different elements that just change and change the whole seascape, change the whole skyscape. And once I got involved in the photography side of things, when I head down the coast with my board and my camera, I was taking my camera out more than my board. That wow. just, okay. just drew me in and just grew from there. Yeah. yeah, nice, nice. I guess what is it that flicked the switch from, I, I guess, just doing ph- photographing what to starting to get into that more conceptual artistic mode of photography, thinking about the composition and the tones and yeah. the colours and all that sort of thing. Where did that start for you? I guess that started for me when I was first researching landscape photography, I came across different photographers online Mm -hmm. and there's one particular photographer from the Ballerine Peninsula in Victoria, a lovely guy called Dean Cooper. So I saw his website and he had some one day workshops, come shoot with me workshops. So I thought, yeah, I'll go and learn from someone who's, who takes great seascape images. I went with Dean down the Great Ocean Road with three other photographers and we spent the day shooting down around Lawn, down past Lawn, towards down towards Apollo Bay, down that area. Yeah, and yeah, that really that sort of was great because it's, there's one photographer, four participants, you get some really good oh, instruction. Time, yeah. Yeah. So that was a one-day workshop I did with him and then a few months later I did a three-day workshop down at Wilson's Prom. Yep. That was the, the theme of that workshop was learning to see. So that yeah. was a proposition. And he's quite an interesting teacher that he draws you through his process of teaching over a three-day period and he teaches you one section and then he'll lead you to another. And if you want to work on other areas like aperture and uh, timing and ISO, he teaches you everything you need to know. Brilliant. Yeah. That really helped me to get into the more into the seascapes. And then what happened after that? Oh, gosh. About a year later, I did a, a seven-day workshop with him on the South Island of New Zealand as well. Nice. So yeah. Each time I went, I just continued to learn more and more things about composition, about elements within a composition, uh, about balance. Yep. And yeah, that really helped me to create images that were whatever you wanted to create, whether it was a a simplistic, minimalistic image, or whether you wanted to have something with a lot of power with emphasising wave action or wind action or whatever it was. Yeah, Yeah, I learned a lot off Dean, and that was really good for me. That was over about a three- or four-year period. Yeah, Did a workshop at King Island and one at Flinders Island, or just down in between Victoria and and Tassie. And he tends to go to the more unvisited places, pretty quiet places where, where not many photographers go. Yeah, yeah. Secret spots that he keeps nice. up his sleeve. <laughs> I might have to hook up with him and a, a do a podcast with him, but also go and spend some time with him uh, with his secret spots. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sounds, uh, sounds fantastic. Definitely, definitely someone that would be interesting on your yeah. podcast. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. What about your motivations? What What makes you get up? ridiculous hours which if you're going to be a, a seascaper there's no point getting out of bed at sunrise or being <laughs> at the beach just on sunrise because yeah. that's not the best light yeah what is it that gets you get gets you out of bed and get you thinking about a shot before you you're actually getting there i think it's the adventure of the unknown of what's going to happen because you can always plan for things yep. but sometimes you're totally surprised and totally, yeah, I guess surprise is the right word. But also you could be looking one direction and turn around and there's a beautiful view behind you as well. Yeah, um, yeah. And in, an example would be going out to shoot sunrise and your face waiting for the sun just to peep over your eyes and you turn around behind you and then the, the moon's setting behind you. And, didn't, and I didn't even plan for that. So yeah, yeah, no, you can just be surprised by different things. I just want to get shots that, just draw the viewer into the image. And they often say, how do you, how did you get that image? I sell a lot of my images at, at a local market down here in Melbourne. It's St Kilda yep. Esplanade Market. It's a maker's market. So I'm constantly explaining to people, how did you get that shot? Is it a painting? 
Um, some are on paper, some are on canvas. And I just love people to see these images and wonder how it was taken and feel like they're drawing into the image. I think that's important. Yeah, definitely. I think that, that's a real challenge for a lot of photography is to get that engagement where people are drawn in and they're looking into that scene feeling like they're there. And, you know, mm-hmm. for me, that's what I try to do with a lot of my photography as well is, is get that feeling for people that they're actually standing there looking and seeing the same thing that I saw. Yeah, and some images tell a story. Uh, yeah, some do, yeah. About the the type of place you're shooting. If you're shooting down at Wilson's Prom, which is renowned for moody, misty, cold, windy weather, if you yep. can get a shot that, that shows that with the movement of the water blowing up the river or and the yeah. clouds passing by on the top of the hills nearby, that's a cool thing because then they think, wow, this is what this is place is this place is fantastic. Do you set yourself projects or challenges, creative challenges, or are you more spontaneous in your shooting? I guess what I'm talking about is are you a planner or <clears throat> somebody that just goes out and says, All right, I'm going out this morning or tomorrow morning? Uh, and- normally I decide I'm going out <clears throat> and then I'll look at the conditions. Yep. And then I'll plan where I'm going to go. Yeah. And how much time I've got. I also like to try and get, like you said, I always get to a place at least an hour before sunrise, depending mm-hmm. on what's going on with the sky. Yep. And start setting up a composition or seeing what's going on with the light and then work from there. I like to go to places that people haven't been before Mm -hmm. uh, and I also like to go to my usual haunts as well. But sometimes I've been out down the Great Ocean Road and the Great Ocean Walk is a beautiful walk that runs from Apollo Bay all the way down to Port Campbell. I've never done the walk, but you can enter that walk space at different areas on the coast. Yep, And sometimes... I'll head down to a track that'll that'll head down to a rock platform. And if there's a low swell and it's safe, I'll just follow the rock platform for a meter, a hundred meters or 200 meters or whatever. Yeah. And it's just amazing what sort of compositions you can create in these places where no one goes. Yeah, and, um, and being on my own and you, you just get lost. I guess you must understand that you get lost in where you are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and just focusing on composition and, and the light's changing and the clouds are moving. It could be even in the middle of the day if there's beautiful clouds going on yeah. and lovely, beautiful rock formations and shapes. That inspires me to go to places where <clears throat> no one's shot before. Yeah, nice. Try and get that, try and get that shot that's different is important to me too, even Absolutely. though we all take shots of the usual haunts. The oh, iconic places good. are iconic for a reason. Yeah. You're always going to see a lot of people shooting in those those, those places. But, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I really appreciate people that go to the effort of getting somewhere that not many people bother to go or not many people can go because mm. it might be quite inaccessible. So if you can get something there, then I think you're doing a great service to people that, that are never going to see that sort of thing that because they're, they're sitting at home on the couch mm-hmm. or they're tucked up in their beds, <laughs> more, more likely, yeah. and yeah. are never going to get never going to experience that. Yeah, and that's the adventure of photography, and that's the beauty of it is you can spend five hours beating your way through the Otway Ranges, following fluorescent tags on trees yep. to find a waterfall that you've googled, and. I had that situation. I tried to get to this waterfall three times, once with someone else, then once with two other people. I even tried on my own once and I rolled my ankle, which wasn't a good thing to do. Ouch. But then yeah. I got there on the fourth time and it was just such a empowering thing. And, and the three of us, when we got there, we got to this waterfall. It's called Staircase Falls. It's about 20 k's out the back of lawn. Yep. And the challenge was realised after three attempts. Yeah, and nice. that's fantastic. And you're in this, you're in the middle of this rainforest area where there's there is no one. There's no major p- tracks like most of the waterfalls have got. There's a few areas where you can see people have been shooting, but it's the true raw beauty, and that, that's something I really love. Yeah, to take yeah, away from those places and the sense of achievement that yourself and two of your mates have done it. And yeah, got yeah, there. Fantastic. Yeah, it's good. How, how about that feeling of sharing the environment? with people because obviously going to some of these places that are almost pristine as you say you might find a fluorescent tag on a tree and there's not much of a track because it's been 
very much less visited than some of the other places. Mm. Is that something that's important to you, sharing that environmental sort of view of the landscape? Yeah, I think that's important to, when you head into these places, you can go to your waterfalls that are set up for tourists with your steps and everything and your, yep. and your viewing platforms. That's important to stay, try and stay within those areas, although sometimes oh, sure. you're tempted to jump out and take the odd shot over the fence, not on the edge of a cliff in a safe area. But, yeah, it is good to show these images because people don't know these places are out there. Yeah. And it's good to be able to show them where they are, where you got it from, the beauty of it, and people connect with it and they might want to hang it on their wall. Who knows? If you're lucky. <laughs> and they've got a story, if you're lucky, yeah. And they've got a story behind it. I like to share stories behind images when people are looking at my work. I can explain how I got there, how this image was taken. Another place that was interesting to get to, there's a place in down here at Cape Shank called Pulpit Rock, and everyone loves to photograph it at sunrise and sunset, and it's an amazing setup, and it's on a little rock platform that's separated from the headland. Yep. And, and I always wanted to get out onto that rock platform and shoot Pulpit Rock from the platform to see what it was like. Yeah. I have surfed around the corner from there on a, a little right-hand break on the other side of the headland. So it's it's quite safe to go there when the swell's low. Yep. So I lined up a couple of friends and I went down there and I, I bought myself a dry bag backpack. Yep. Threw my camera in, my, my filters and, and tied my tripod on and then I paddled out on my surfboard around yep. the corner to get to the rock platform Jumped up on the rock platform and I had a couple of friends back on the headland who were there watching me. They were taking photos as well. of, the, of yeah, the yeah. And it was pretty cool to get out there because no one had been out there before and I found these amazing huge rock pools on this rock platform, similar to the ones that are back on near the headland. Yeah. And I just got lost out there. I was in my wetsuit and my booties and I had my camera and I was just taking photos. Like we got out there about 5 o'clock and sunset was around 6.37. Yep. And I got lost in it again, and I ended up having to paddle in just on dusk. I had my head torch on, and I'm basically <laughs> on the rock platform watching me. Yeah, you're good. So I'm paddling in, and it's all a bit kelpy in the dark. So yeah, fantastic. That was pretty exciting, and and I got some beautiful images that you would never get unless you just yeah, took a literally no one else has ever seen. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I wasn't. Uns- I didn't do it with huge waves. It was a really low swell. It was low tide. It was safe to do so. Yeah. Crack and it turned out it'd be a great little shoot. How how would you describe your style? Oh, uh, <clears throat> I, look, I, I pretty much always try and do long exposure photography, but from yep. three minutes down to 0.5 of a second. Yeah. That's, that sort of thing. I just love capturing wave movement or lack of wave movement. Yeah, I think most of my work has got some sort of length of time that I sh- open the shutter more than just a short amount of time. If you ask me to go and shoot birds flying past, I would have no idea what setting to put the camera <laughs> It's definitely not one of my things, but I really admire how people do that. Yeah, um, absolutely. I shoot with, he does that. He's got a big long lens and he sets his camera up and he's like a big gun. He shoots it and he gets some incredible images of birds, but yeah, yeah. that's just not me. Um I'm not into portrait photography. I know nothing about it. I know nothing about lighting, all that sort of thing. Yep. So I just love capturing nature, capturing what it does, what it surprises you with, and, yeah, and, and continually keep learning how to do that. Fantastic. How do you define success with your photography? I guess I, for me, because I quit my full-time job back in, 2019 and started getting my work printed and decided to start selling it Mm. i didn't have a website back then i thought i'll I'll do the markets on the mornington peninsula sure so i started doing that and it didn't have a lot of success in selling many images yeah you have grand ideas about how it's all going to work out yeah you're going to make millions yeah and then Yeah, so once COVID came along, that sort of all stopped and the markets closed down. And so I started working on editing. Yep. So now this time my daughter bought me a, an editing session with a phot- local photographer. Nice. So yep. I didn't know a lot about editing on Lightroom and Photoshop and those sort of things. I went and did some editing with a chap called Ben Erickson. 
on the Mornington Peninsula. So that sort of created another passion for me because I wasn't really doing a lot with my shots. I was doing a bit of edi- editing on a, a Canon system that came with my camera. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that opened up a whole new area of learning for me, which was good. So that sort of, I guess that was a bit of a success for me because I changed from just doing basic editing to extending what I could do. And and then I learned through Ben how to get images print ready for printing, which was really good, learning how to get the sizes correct, adding borders, all those sort of things you need when you want to print your images and get them framed and, and sell them at markets or wherever you want to sell them. So that was a really good time for me to learn while the markets were closed. So I used that time to improve my skills. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, I think that was a, an opportunity that came up for me because the company who was printing my images, at that time they were growing during the COVID period. Yeah. They needed a, a framer. I scored a job as their framer, so I would cut, join, and glaze all their frames. So I did that for two years. Nice. And I- more, learnt more about framing, printing processes, all that sort of mm. thing. And yeah, that was great. So that sort of helped me to then increase the quality of my images. I learned about how to do the framing. And yeah, so then I started out back into the markets again, back in 2021, I think it was, late 21. Yep. 22. And yeah, so that's been successful. I sell quite a few images at the market. And I also started a framing business myself so I can frame images for other people as well as myself. And then I took it a step further and I've actually started, I did back in 2021, started making my own frame material. So I I was using commercial frames, plantation timber, but I also started machining up because I'm a carpenter by, by trade. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so that was good. I bought table saw, thicknessing machine. So I was getting a lot of old building materials. And so I'm trying to market and sell rescued timber frames, not just, nice. yeah. So it's rather than throw things into into landfill, yeah, get yeah. beautiful old building materials from different sources. And it you can get, you don't have to pay for it. You can pick it up from around the traps where, where you've got connections. Yeah. And I get given these beautiful Jarra door sills off a hundred year old house so it's just wow. quality timber and different types of oregon baltic pine and yeah so that's something i'm pushing now trying to open up people's eyes that you can get a beautiful timber frame that's from recycled timber but it's beautifully dressed like it's a it looks like a quality commercial yeah. frame that you would buy from a wholesaler or a framing shop fantastic yeah, so that's I love doing that as well. So there's a lot of aspects to what I do. I don't just take photos. I I try and do the whole thing. I've got a an installation service for art and art installation service as well. So yeah. I've got my fingers in a lot of different areas just to make a living, I guess you'd say. Yeah, I, and that's I guess one of the important lessons for people to learn if they want to get into photography as a business is that you've kind of got to diversify beyond just trying to sell prints or just trying to sell NFTs or whatever it is that you want to <laughs> you know, sell in terms of your core images and get into things, as you say, like framing or printing or uh, other aspects that are related. And you can then start to see some light of day in terms of making some money out of it. Yeah, yeah, true, true. And yeah, that's great. Right. In terms of that balance between doing all of those things, how do you balance life and your photography? I guess my 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 main thing is that I sell my images on a Sunday at the St Kilda yep. Market. So depending on what happens there, then I've usually got a day or two of first thing I do is I send off what images I need printed off to my printer on Sunday night or Monday morning, then I've yep. got to pick them up in a couple of days when they're ready. So in the meantime, I, I might produce some framing material. or I, I now frame up at a, a little workshop up in Nutter Wadding where I've got access to a framing, all the framing tools I need there. Yep. And I work, work, work with a, a lady there called Diana and she's got her own little business 
where she does framing as well for other clients. So we work, we share this space together. Yeah, nice. So yeah, it all revolves around what happens on that Sunday. And then that'll get me busy for a couple of days, two or three yeah. days. And then I might do a, a small carpentry job, those sort of things, because I'm not framing full time at this other business where I was for a couple of years. That that sort of filled in my week. But now I've got two or three days where I can just pursue other things. I yeah, can get yeah, right. a bit more. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just a matter of putting it all together. And, and there's a bit of a pattern that forms and it, and it works well. Yeah, yeah. I th- and I, I think that's another important thing is that rhythm or pattern, as you called it, of things. You've got a regular stake in the ground that you've got to meet things for, so everything revolves around doing that. It, it yeah. does make a big difference to how you operate. Yeah. And there's also other things that I've got planned for the future. I'm not always going to do a Sunday market for the rest of my life. I might want to step out and there's big markets that are, that are set up for a three or four day period and you can yeah, go right. to, to different places. So yep. there's a, there's one I'm looking at going to in Adelaide in November. So yeah. that's a three day one. Uh, I wouldn't mind giving that, that a go and rather than just doing the one day markets, uh, I try and get my images into cafes yep. and, and work out a deal with the cafe owner. So as the sales happen, you just um, can can take orders. That sort of thing can work well, depending on how the what the vibe in the cafe is like and how how keen the owner of the cafe is to spruik your work. Yeah, yeah. and have nice pictures on his wall too. Exactly, that's right. That's fantastic. I know a few photographers that do that, and and it can work really well. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of ideas, but you've got to continually be thinking. Okay, what am I going to try next? What am I going to do next? What am I going to learn next? Yeah. Definitely. There's always something you need to learn, which is the beauty of photography and, and everything else that goes around it. Definitely. Spe- speaking of learning, how do you price your work? Do you do a, a cost plus model or do you not have a model at all and you just yeah, that's put a, a sticker that's a on it and say that's the price? That's a tricky one because depending because I'm not a world-famous photographer, you can't charge what you like. But yeah. it all depends on what your overheads are. See, I do everything... I do all my machining at home. I work at a, another framing shop, which doesn't cost me anything as far as yep. overheads. So my costs are low, and I just want my images to be out there. I don't charge huge amounts of money for my images. Maybe one day I might be able to, but at this stage I'm happy to get my work out there. <clears throat> but my costs are based on what the materials cost me. If I'm yeah, using right. commercial frames, then I've got a, you've got your acrylic, you've got your foam core, you've got your commercial frames, your hanging system. So all that yep. all comes into it. And then what's the cost of going out and shooting sunrise and getting a perfect shot? Yeah, you know, this is it. You can charge Even when you love it. <laughs> exactly, yeah. That's my passion. So I'm happy for people to share in my images that I've captured when I'm out enjoying yeah. life. So that's a good thing. And I think my website prices are different to my market prices. Yeah, right. I've learned at markets you need to have you need to have products from $25 up to $500 and everywhere in between. You yeah. can't just go in with three images at $900 each and expect to sell one of them. Ah, fair enough. You've got to be able to cater for everyone's needs at a market. And I guess you've got to connect. Your images have got to connect with the right person as well, yeah. which is what happens a lot of the time. I get stories from people who say, I'm buying this image because of this reason. Yeah. This has got a great memory for them for me or this has got a sad memory but it was a beautiful memory i love this place i'm going to buy that image and or i've got a holiday house there so yeah selling your images for me is is about connecting with people i think and that's i guess a successful thing to do yeah fantastic fantastic in terms of where you like to shoot obviously you mentioned a few hot spots the wilson's prom and the Bellarine and uh, Great Ocean Road and so forth. Uh, what, what's your favourite area to to get stuck into? I think my favourite area is probably down the Great Ocean Road, yeah. but because of the accessibility, it's a couple of hours drive, two and a half hours drive. Yep. I don't get down there as often as as I like, but uh, for accessibility, I think the Mornington Peninsula is probably good for me. That's only a half hour trip, and uh, I can get down there pretty quickly and, and enjoy what's down there yeah fantastic we've got phillip island nearby as well which is a really nice spot to to shoot 
And yeah, it's, there's other places further afield that, that I'd like to get to occasionally, but it's, yeah. it's just a matter of um, setting up the time to do it. For people that don't know some of those areas, how how would you describe, say, the Mornington Peninsula? I guess the Mornington Peninsula is made up of one side you've got the ocean and yep. Bass Strait, I guess you call it, or the Southern Ocean, Bass Strait yeah. probably. And on the other side of the Mornington Peninsula, you've got Port Phillip Bay. So you've yeah. got a beautiful calm bay, which can get crazy with a northerly wind, but when it's howling southwesterly winds on the ocean side, and it's crazy. You can always go over to, to the Port Phillip Bay side and get a nice offshore wind. Yep. So the ocean side is just rugged coastline with some sandy beaches, a lot of small little tiny bays that are getting worn away by the ocean and, and the erosion. And then also part of the Mornington Peninsula goes around into Western Port Bay, which is right. yep. there were any flinders in that area there, which is more gentle beaches and that sort of thing. So I guess you've got the best of both worlds down there. You've got yeah. beautiful ocean beaches, your, your little inlets, your little bays. Plenty, of, of, plenty of rock platforms around. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And there's an area at Portsea where there's a, a series of three or four kilometres of beaches and they've got a whole lot of private jetties and they're pretty cool to shoot. I, I'm, I'm a bit of a sucker for sticks and water. I get down there and shoot those a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, that's that's one area that you can never stop exploring because there's always something new to find down there for sure. Yeah, fantastic. What's the most memorable place you've shot? Oh, that's an interesting question. Most memorable place I've shot. Okay, I think it was re- last year I went down to Flinders Island. Yep. On a workshop with Dean, as I mentioned before. And Flinders Island, I think it's only got a population of a couple of hundred people, and it's a huge island, so there's just you, you don't see anyone. Yeah. You see a lot of wallabies, that's about it. And there's only two small towns at either end of the island, a small airport. And the raw beauty of that place, it's just amazing. It's Some people say it's like King Island on steroids because King Island's further across, but it's also yeah. like Wilson's Prom on steroids. Yeah, it's, yeah. There's so much beautiful rock formations, colours, little inlets, bays. Yeah, so I spent five days down there last year and that's a place that I'd love to go back. It was just incredible places. You'd pull up at these beaches and these bays and there's just boulders poking out of the water everywhere and and lying on their side. And you just think, wow, this is just amazing. It was so good. And, And as I said, Dean runs workshops down there and I don't know many others. There are probably others that do. But yeah, the good old Flinders Island would be one to to go back to again, definitely. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Have you had any horror stories in your photography career yet? Horror stories? Oh, you mean dropping a lens or something? Or? That, that, that's one horror story. Yeah. Yeah, I had my lens fall off once. I was up in Broome a couple of years ago and I'm not sure how I didn't put it on correctly, but the lens fell off my camera and split the it was on my 24 to 105 and it split the little casing around it, but it oh. still works. Yeah. Unless you put a 10 stop in your filter and it pops the open the casing a little bit and it lets a tiny bit of light in. So yeah, yeah. yeah that was I, I've never got around to getting it fixed because I can still use it, but not with a 10 stop in it. So yeah, okay. That was a bit of a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> no, other than that, I haven't dropped the camera in the water or been drenched or drowned or or anything like that. I, I'm, I've grown up on the coast and grown up surfing, so I'm just so used to rambling around on rock platforms and and just watching the surf, waiting waiting a good five or ten minutes just to see what the ocean's doing and see if any sets come through. Yep. Um, yeah, so I don't really go anywhere where I'm going to be up over my head in water. Yeah, yeah. Oh. That badly yet. <laughs> I've stood in the wrong place a few times and drenched, drenched the camera largely from having it too close to the too close to the waves or uh, yep. stood with my back to a wall that then had a wave come up and over the back of me and drenched, oh, no. drenched yeah. me. So, yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah, but that's I, part of fun. If you can come out and tell the story, that's a good thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Exciting. Yeah. I've ne- never had any anything really sketchy, though, where, where I've, fallen in the water or anything like that though. yeah yeah uh, yeah 
I guess when I did my ankle that time when I, I was pretty silly, I shouldn't have gone by myself, but I had to get the shot. I just <laughs> put my foot through a rotten log and just oh, rolled. Uh, yeah. And used to use my tripod as a little crutch to get me. I had to walk a couple <laughs> of k's back up an old fire track once I got back there and, oh, and I had the shoe off till I got home and it was quite large and I ended up chipping my talus bone and had to wear a moon boot for a while. Oh, ouch. Uh, that's probably the worst thing that's happened to me. But if that's uh, the worst thing, then I'm, I'm not doing too bad. Yeah, no, you're doing all right. What do you learn about the world through photography? Oh, what have I learned about the world through photography? Just how you just can't take it for granted what's going to happen. Yep. That you're always going to be surprised. And, yeah, I think that's the thing, the surprising nature of what goes on out there that not many people see because they're not out there analysing it or looking at it through a lens. Sure. sure. And, uh, yeah, just how you're always astounded by something else that you didn't think would happen. How did I capture that? I'd experiment with with ICM images, intentional ca- camera movement, and yep. I, I didn't know anything about it, but I thought, look, I'll give it a crack, and I, I Googled how to do it and set your timer and where you go, and I was blown away by, by what I found in those sort of shots. Yeah, and, yeah. And it's just incredible what a, a lens can pick up at the right time, at the right moment. And nature's, you just capture something that may never happen again. Yeah. So that's the beauty of what I found through photography, that there's always something new. There's always something challenging. There's always something beautiful. Sometimes it's not always there. And then the light will change and then it's there. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the incredible thing that I've found about photography and what I've learned about nature. Yeah. The number of times I've been out on a grey morning and thinking I'm going to get skunked here and just not, there's not going to be any light. And then you just get this little break in the cloud and yeah. ray of sunshine comes through. and Yeah. yeah. yeah and there's your shot. And there's you know, your shot. ray of sunshine will, will shine down right in line with, with your jetty that you're shooting. You go, what did that happen? A lot, of, a lot of times it won't do that. Definitely 99 times out of 100 it won't. But that one time you were there, that's and if it. you're not out there, then you're not going to get it. Exactly. So, Exactly. That's, that's the cool thing about commitment and, and making the effort to get out there. Yeah. Absolutely. Fun. Yeah. Are there any particular things you, other than going to places that a lot of people don't go, is there anything that you might be doing that you think might be a bit different to others? And if so, why do you do them? Different to others. Well, that's something I try and always do is get a shot that is different that yeah. I have before. I think that's one of my main goals these days because you go to a lot of places and you take a lot of the similar shots and, the, and you think, oh, gosh, I've been this place 10 times. And then, but one time you go there, the light might do something, the clouds might be doing something. Yep. And you get that shot that you have never got before. Yeah. Um, it might be something that you haven't seen before as well. And, yeah, I think that's how I try and be different to other people, but it doesn't always happen because it's, there's a lot of seascape photographers out there. There's a lot of people that do what we do. And yep. To have a point of difference is difficult, but it, yeah, it, it's, it's a challenge. Yeah. And it's something that you just can't want to keep on doing. Yeah. I think for me, it's about trying to, as we said before, trying to get that feeling and convey that feeling of being there. That, that's, yeah. that, that's the point of difference I look for in my photography is, no, unless I'm there with 20 other photographers, which is rare. <laughs> <laughs> rare for me anyway yeah. <laughs> you're the pretty much the only person stood there taking that shot at that time that that particular sunrise and that that particular wave action that's going on the tide and all those different things mm. the, if, if you go at the same sort of tide height every couple of months or so when the tides are about the same and the conditions are always going to be different so to me it, it's being able to find that unique seen that not saying it can never be replicated but it's hard to replicate yeah and there's so many variations too you could be out there oh. shoot and some sort of cloud just comes by and just i don't know balances an image with your yep. subject whatever your subject might be and yeah. one of the things I, I learned through dean was i often look at my image and, and my foreground is my is where i start and then i f- try and find my subject from my yep. foreground and I'm, I'm just i'm always looking at the ground and i'm I get my camera on its tripod and I've got it on live view and I just walk around with my camera in front of me looking at my live view screen and, and all of a sudden, oh, bang, the composition hits you. Yeah. You yeah. tripod, you lower it, you do whatever, then you slowly 
what I've been taught through Dean again was you just keep refining that image. You're taking a shot and then you look at it and you go, oh, that's that court could be quite. I could just change that position a little bit just to get that yeah, edge. Lift, right. lift the camera or drop yeah, it down. Yeah, just take away that separation. Yeah. Seaweed or whatever it might be, just tweak sure. the camera and get the composition. Rather than go out and banging off 50, 100 shots, start off with one shot and just refine that shot four or five or six times and mm. then you've got your shot. And then, right, where's my next shot going to be? And then head off somewhere else or even... If you're in portrait mode, change it to landscape. You go, oh, what's it look like in landscape? Try yeah. that as well. Because if you don't try new things, you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, you're point. never going to know. Yeah. yeah, yeah so. you, you find yourself, you've set up your composition, you're in the field there and everything looks good. Do you find yourself then thinking, oh, oh that looks good over there. I'm going to head down there while you're still shooting that comp or yeah, that, I, I know that's what I do. But. Yeah, no, I totally agree. That can happen a lot. You know, yeah. you your main subject and you've got wherever you are. And then you look behind you and you, and you see this beautiful line of seaweed where the high tide has taken, finished yeah. the seaweed off and there's no footprints there. So you wander back and oh, I'm always worried I don't want to get footprints in my shot. You take the line way around, you set up your camera and you go to landscape and you go, where did this come from, this image? You, you had no idea it was there until you walked 50 metres along the beach and set up. That's and, it. Yeah. yeah it's, I guess it's important for me to try and not stay in the one spot, but just walk around three or four yeah, places yeah. while you've got the light and see what you can create. Yeah, so are you, you're trying to get as many different compositions as you can, or are you concentrating on like two or three when you're on a shoot? Yeah, I'd say probably two or three, but refining each one. Yeah, um, yeah. It depends where you are. Sometimes you can be on a beach an empty beach where you're only going to shoot one or two compositions, maybe try something different at either end of the beach. Yeah. But if you're in an area where there's a whole bunch of little inlets of rock platforms and different little coves, I'll, I'll just wander for an hour or two and just see what I can find. And yeah. if, I, I might, if I've got four hours, I'll stay there for four hours if the light's right. <laughs> but as soon as the sun comes up and you might head off, it's coffee time. Yeah. I've come, I've, Taken to coming back after having a coffee or a, a bacon sandwich and just having another look while there's still a bit of side light going, not necessarily, not I'm not talking middle of the day sort yeah. of harsh light, I'm talking there's, there's still a bit of side light around and just looking for things that are a little bit different to the normal seascape, that sort of broader view and just looking at, looking down at my, my feet, the rock platform itself and the textures in the rocks. Is there anything yes. there? Is there anything in the sand, the ripples on the sand? And the, is there a creek running down that's made or made patterns or something or waves that are made patterns in the sand? So they're, they're some of the things that I've taken to doing to change up just that standard seascape. Here's a nice shot. Here's a nice foreground. Here's a nice wave breaking with, with the action and a nice sunrise. Yeah, no, that's great because it's not until you you do look down and see these things. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And when you're looking for a foreground, you're looking for shapes and textures and angles and things. And I have noticed some of your shots lately. Yeah, you have been doing a few of those shots of, of different patterns and things like that in the rocks, which is really beautiful stuff too. It doesn't yeah. have to be the whole scene. It can be part of the no, scene. No, that's it. Yeah. Getting getting focused down on one or two square metres as opposed to trying to take something that's a couple of hundred <laughs> kilometres wide. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's beauty everywhere, mate, isn't there? Absolutely. Absolutely. You've been out into the field. You've taken your shots. Are you straight into editing or are you one that leaves it? Not, to not always. I've still got some shots I took last week that I haven't edited only because yeah. I've been doing other things. But I used to get right into it like I, straight away that when I got home. But I tend to just jump on when I've got some spare time and go through the shots and pick two or three and work on them and then leave them for a while, brood over them for a while, then go back. And if it's something I really love, I'll work on it longer and try different things. Mm -hmm. I try and get my images sort of 80 to 90% in the in camera, then try not to do have to do too much afterwards. Yep. Sometimes... An image warrants you to spend a bit more time on it just to bring out what you want to, the story you might want to tell or the beauty that you saw that morning. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, so editing's fun and sometimes I can get a bit slack on it and leave them in the camera for a week or two and then have a go at them later on. I think, oh, I don't remember taking that shot. So 
It's like, that's a good thing. Yeah. Well, I never leave them on the camera, personally. I, I always get them off. Okay. Because, yeah, I, I, I don't know if you've heard the recent pod, podcast, but I've got a bit of a sponsorship deal with a backup company. I have yeah, I heard that, yeah. Yeah, and so one, one of the reasons why that's... I was in IT for a long time, so I learned through experience that back up and then back up again. Yeah, I don't leave them on the camera. I, I just don't trust the, the the card or the camera to retain it for very long. And I try to get them down onto a, a hard drive quick as I can and then into the backup solution as, as quick as I can so that uh, I know I've got at least two copies. I yes. try to keep three of everything. Okay. Um, one, sure. one in the cloud. That's excellent. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> one in the cloud, one on one on my desk, yep. on on my machine, and also which is the one that I work with. And the other backups a a land drive that I've got that backs up everything that's important to me. Back your stuff up. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally agree. I do up download most images onto a PC, and then I've also got some on a laptop as well. But yeah, I'm, I'm not as organised as you. That sounds like a good system. Yeah, no, it, 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 I wouldn't have done the sponsorship if I didn't think it was important and, yeah. and I wasn't using the product myself. For me, it, it's really around making sure that I don't I don't lose anything. I have lost raw files in the past and mm. it's just, it's not fun <laughs> because you're sitting there going, I know I got some bangers and yeah. I can't do anything about it now. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty cheese to get out again, hey? <laughs> That's it. Oh, well, yeah, you've got to go back to the same spot. So sometimes I, I, I lost a few from uh, a Canada trip in uh, 2019. So I've got to go back to Canada in winter, unfortunately. How sad. <laughs> There's a lot of places we want to get back to now that COVID's... Yeah, definitely. Proactive. Definitely. So in in terms of your editing, are you spending five minutes per... You said you want to try and get as much done in camera. Are you spending five minutes on an image, 10 minutes, an hour? Yeah, I'll, I'll look at somewhere. It could be 15 minutes, could be 20 minutes, could be half an hour. Yeah, yeah. But if I've got an image that I know I've got to print, yeah. Um, if it's just an image for Instagram or, or something like that, but I wouldn't spend a, a lot of time on it. But if it's something that's a, an image that someone's asked for or I know I'm going to print, then sure, sure. I'll, I'll work on it as far as tidying up the dust spots and hot pixels because I do have a fair bit of long exposure, so there's a few hot pixels going on. Yep, yep. Um, I jump into Photoshop and, and do a bit of work there. So I do a little bit of stuff in Lightroom and then go across to Photoshop and and because you can't be printing a huge image with a little hot pixel down the bottom right-hand corner. Um, no, when you blow it up, it doesn't look real flash. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did print. an image for a, a glass flashback. My first glass flashback. Oh wow! Yeah. And, um, it was of a jetty, a local jetty here. It was it was four meters long by nine hundred high. So a wow. shot that I'd stitched together, and it, it took me three shoots to get the shot because there's always fishermen in the way or yeah. something yeah. going on. Eventually got the shot, and then I remember Ben, who I did my editing course with, he said, now, we've got to make sure there's no hot pixels on that because it's going to get printed onto a bit of glass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's going to be an expensive redo. Yes, yes, yeah. So my my system with that is to, to go through horizontally, vertically, magnified up to 300%, so I'll, I'll make sure I get rid of any possibilities. So yeah, fantastic. Take a bit of time, yeah. <laughs> Have you ever hit a creative wall? I hit a creative wall. Not re- the only time I would say I would have hit a, hit a creative wall was when I haven't been motivated to get out, when I've yeah. had things on, when there's been a, a time when that the, the weather's not that great, it's clear skies, all that sort of thing, and you just don't want to get out and shoot. I guess that's when I hit a bit of a creative wall when I haven't been out, but that's easy to fix. It's just a matter of getting out more often. I think because... What I shoot is always changing. There's always something to create from what you shoot. Sure. Uh, and there's always new things to do as far as places to go, new places to shoot, new things to learn once you've taken those shots. I've done a I've done quite a bit of spent quite a bit of time learning from other photographers, as I yep. said before. And there's always I've always found there's always something else I want to learn. As you progress and you might plateau a bit in what you're doing and what you've learned. Yeah, 
I'll say, okay, what's next for me to learn? What's next for me? To, what's the next challenge? And I think that's important. So yeah, you, don't, you don't get into that creative rut because yeah. that's what I think you could get into a rut when you're just doing the same old thing all the time. So yeah, that might be a time to jump in and, and go to that next level, whatever that might be for each person. Yeah. What sort of things do you do to set yourself new creative challenges? Oh, what sort of things do I do? Hmm. I guess learning a new skill. Yeah. Uh, I'll yeah. see something that someone's done on an image or I'll, I'll see someone, I might be out shooting with a friend and they'll be doing something different in the way they take the shot and then seeing the way they edit a shot. I think that's a good way to learn because you see what these people are doing. You think, wow, that's pretty cool. I, I wouldn't mind giving that a try. And I have had that experience with a, a, a guy I've been shooting with on and off for the last few months. He's a fella I met just shooting down the beach. And he's from England, so he didn't know where all the good places were to go. So we've headed off five or ten times around the area and shot. And he's got a really interesting way he edits. Yeah. Um, we went away for a couple of nights down the prom recently and at night we'd ed do our editing. And it's just good to see the way other people do it because there's always a challenge there for you. And, yeah, I think learning from other people inspires me to take that next step as well and seeing what yeah, other people do. Yeah. Oh, that's great. What do you see as the biggest challenge facing photography right now? The biggest challenge? What oh, are gosh, that's interesting. I don't know. I don't know if it is it challenged by artificial intelligence? Is it challenged by what people can do in post production? And that that's all new and different. And some of the people, some of the things that people do in their editing is incredible. And it's art. It's beautiful digital art as well. So is that challenging photography? Some say it is, some say it isn't. And everyone has got their own creative style and flair. So yeah. I know that, yeah, that, that AI stuff that came out a little while ago, there was people putting shots up on Instagram of what they've created, yeah. different things. And that's pretty amazing. But is it photography? Mate, it is photography, but it's being created by something else, which is Cool. cool. Still an image. I was talking to somebody not long ago, actually, about that, and I, my my opinion. This is just my thoughts on it. I, I think the images look absolutely stunning, and yes, you've got to be fairly clever in how you word your request to get an image. Mm. But it's like me saying to you, "Go and take me a, a, a shot down at." the Great Ocean Road of the however many apostles are left. <laughs> uh, and you'll come back and show me that shot and I'll say, all right, no, I want it a little pinker or I want it a little bit darker or whatever. I want it at a sunrise instead of sunset. And I want to, and then I might say, all right, no, I want the aurora over it and so forth. But it's not me doing it. It's you doing it. And it's that machine is the thing that's doing it. And it's really the skill of the programmers that taught the program or built the program to go through the heuristics of all of these other images that it's been trained on to deliver an image which is not, it's not that it's not real or anything, but it's not that person's image other than they've asked for it. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. So it's, to, to me, it's a bit like someone commissioning somebody to create an image for you, not going out and doing it yourself. And in, in terms of landscape photography anyway, the people are still going to want the experience of standing knee deep in water, whether it's a waterfall or a seascape or climbing that mountain or taking that astro shot because that experience in itself has value over and above just the image that you end up with at the end of the day. True. Yeah, definitely. I totally agree with that. It's, it's all about the journey sometimes as well yeah. as creating the image. And yeah, so I don't know. That's, it's, I guess you could liken it like an AI image where however it works, I have no idea how they create them, but I'd imagine it's like AI where you use those 
things to create emails and write write creative stories for you. Those programs, I guess. yeah, it's the same, the same sort of concept. Yeah. yeah, it's going to be likened to asking an artist to paint a picture. Of yeah, a it's just that it's in a pro, it's in a program in a. Yeah, computer. it takes a lot less time. <laughs> Does it? Yeah, but that's his interpretation of it, eh? Um, that's right. Whoever yeah. the artist is who paints that picture or the illustrator or whatever it is. And I get some people add their own images or do composites of their own images and AI and that sort of thing. And, you know, the digital artistry beyond just taking the straight output out of the machine, I, I get it. There's, there's, a, yeah. there, there's an artistry to that. And, yes, there's an artistry in coming up with a, the concept and coming up with a set of words, a string of words that actually delivers what you want. Yes. Um, yeah. But beyond that, it's the machine that's doing the work. True. Yeah, so I guess that is a challenge of photography in some ways. Yeah. yeah. Where, where do you see the future of photography going? For me? Uh, I'm not sure where it's going to go for me. I'm continually trying new things as far as my photography. And, yeah, I'm pretty happy selling my images. I'm keen to to also continue with the recycled and rescued frames that's a good thing to do and just expand on that and try and educate people about what you can do with products that normally would get thrown away into the landfill and it's so, there's so much beauty in these reclaimed products and I think that's something that, that interests me and I've also recently started doing ones, what's called a live edge frame, where for some reason I came across some timber that was cut into a certain shape, but it still had the bark, had the bark on it, okay. like a thin layer, thin layer of bark. And I thought, what am I going to do with this? So I machined it up and I dressed the edges and I left the bark on the face of the frame. Yeah. So on the sides you've got these beautiful grains and on the front you've got the natural finish of a really fine bark. Yeah. Look, I'll give this a crack. So I framed it up and I, I put an image of the 12 apostles in there and had yep. a nice white mat, took it to the market and I said, that looks fantastic and it sold so quickly. Yeah. Here those, that live edge timber tabletops you see around, that yeah. sort of thing. So there's all these new things that, that I see myself doing and so now I'm collecting pieces of timber that I can do that with and my wife and I wander along the beach at Portsea down on the back beach, we come back with a whatever timber that comes across in front of us, we find washed up bits of dead wood. And not everyone likes that rustic look, but some people really just gravitate yeah, to it. It suits, suits some people's taste and their, their, their style of home, et cetera, and their furniture. Yeah. 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 yeah, I can get hold of old slabs of timber from a local jetty when they were renovating it. And yeah. put some images, take some shots of that jetty, frame them up in some timber from that jetty, and that tells a story. Yeah, it. that's a really cool thing to do. Yeah. Um, I try and do things like that where the frame tells a story about the image as well. Fantastic. It's not always easy to do that. you just got to be in the right place at the right time. Yeah, to, definitely. To that timber. Yeah. Yeah. What's your favourite thing about being a photographer? Oh, just being out there. just love being out there. Growing up on the coast, Surfing, as soon as we were 18, we were just down the coast every weekend surfing and just the love of the coast, the love of being out there, the love of what's going to happen or doesn't happen. Yep. And the excitement that brings. Yeah, it's just a passion that um, yeah, fantastic. just draws you in. What's your least favourite thing about being a photographer? Least favourite thing about being a photographer? Gosh, is there one? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> you can't love it all, surely. <laughs> oh, heading out and thinking that you've got some good shots, and then coming home and looking on your laptop <laughs> and your husband, that's probably the worst. Yeah. Yeah. I really nailed a couple of shots today on the on your on your viewfinder or on your on the back of your camera, and then you get home and go, no, nah, no, nah, no. Nah. And then, but yeah. the beauty of that, the other side of the coin is that you go out and you just don't think you've got any decent shots, and you come back when you think, wow, yeah, you come cool. back and you got a banger. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah, so yeah. it works both ways. Fantastic. Have you got any tips for somebody who's just starting out in landscape photography? Oh, what I did was I just Googled landscape photography and, and like I said before, you come up with those 10 tips and those 10 tips vary depending on where you go. Sure. The tips, get out early, stay out late. Yep. Go overnight if you can. 
if you want to do some astro shooting. Yeah, go back repeatedly. <laughs> yeah, learn how to look at these apps and think, it, work out when the core of the of the Milky Way is going to rise. And that's a skill in itself, working out where that's going to happen and over what subject you want it to happen, whether it's horizontal. Yeah. I guess it's just getting out there. And the more you're out there, the more you learn. Try and hang out with some other photographers and learn from them because everyone's got a different story and a different way of looking at it. That's one thing I found was good with Instagram when I, I've met some really great photographers through Instagram, which I've shot with over the last few years. And it's a great community to hang out with because everyone's, you might be shooting with a CEO of a company or a, yep. a, a commercial photographer who does it on the weekends for relaxation. I met a guy through Instagram who was a commercial photographer. I knew, didn't even know the guy. We decided to meet up. Port Sea Back Beach and we're, we're going to ride our bikes into the National Park because you can't get in before sunrise because it's blocked yeah. off the vehicles. So I met this guy who I'd never met before and we jumped on our bikes and rode in and got some great shots and he said, oh, I'm a commercial photographer. I thought, how lucky am I to, to meet up with a, someone who knows about photography? And he taught me a lot about photography. He was Fantastic. a lovely guy and I, I enjoyed meeting up with him and, and you just bump into other photographers down the beach. So... Yeah, try and hang out with other people. And, and everyone loves to share their knowledge and, and share their passion. In totally. Yeah. Which, is, which is good. Thank you for sharing some of yours. Uh, are there any photographers out there, other than Dean Cooper, obviously, that you think <laughs> I should be talking to? I mentioned Ben Erickson before. Yep. He's a, a photographer from the Mornington Peninsula and very experienced photographer. He's a lovely guy. He's a fun guy. And, yeah, I think he'd be someone that you'd be interested in interviewing. You'd get a lot of great stories from Ben and his knowledge is extensive as well. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks for that. Me too, yeah. I got my last question and if you've listened to any of my podcasts, you'll know know what I'm about to ask. And for a lot of people, it's really important issue that we've got to try and get to the bottom of. Do you like pineapple on pizza? <laughs> oh, look, I, I occasionally I'll have it, but not too often. Yeah. I'm a capricosa man myself. <laughs> ah, fair enough. Yeah, no, that, that's a good pizza. I like the capricosa, yeah. especially the anchovies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you very much for taking some time to let us into your world, Glenn. It's been wonderful getting to know you a little bit better. That's been uh, where question. can people find your work? Where can people find my work? Yeah. On my website, glennwalkerphotography.com. Yep. And come down to the St Kilda Market on Sundays and you'll, you'll be able to say good day. I'd love you to drop in and say hi. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Thanks, Grant. Thanks again for listening to Landscape Photography World. I hope you enjoyed the show and keep listening because I'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes. You can find my work in this podcast at grantswimbledonphotography.com. I'm also on Vero, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram and Facebook. I'm Grant Swinburne. Hope to see you out shooting soon.